It's the... I'm sure there are people out there who thought this game was a dream. Kingdom Under Fire the Crusaders is a tactical RTS action hack and slash RPG something that was an Xbox exclusive in 2004. Then, 16 years later, it got an official PC port. Better late than never, huh? This is a very basic port because yeah, you can technically play with mouse and keyboard now, but that's like saying technically you can skip work if you light yourself on fire. I mean, you could, but this is a game you play with a controller. The only fancy new visuals are that you can turn up your shadow resolution. By just starting a game, you are treated to a huge amount of lore. That's because Crusaders is a sequel. So while I'd wager most people know this game in Heroes, I'm gonna go over the weird road this franchise has taken. In 2001, we've got Kingdom Under Fire A War of Heroes. It didn't sell well in the West, but did very good in Korea. That could be because this game and the entire franchise is Korean. What's clear is that A War of Heroes desperately wanted to be a Blizzard game. It tried to combine both Warcraft and Diablo, and it wasn't so good at that. It also started with a huge lore dump, and combining the mistranslations and weird writing, a lot of finer details will become borderline incomprehensible. The Shrek storybook in Crusaders does cover the big point. There was a war between good and evil, and a mysterious relic called the Ancient Heart. If you see the heart, or touch the heart, or think about the heart, you turn evil. How the fuck do you beat that? Apparently the answer is God gets really pissed off and gets rid of it. So where the battle and heart smiting took place is now known as the Holy Ground. Okay, but quick side note, the Ancient Heart also resurrected and created this world's version of Sauron. We've had Kmart Sauron, actual Sauron, now make way for Baywatch Sauron. The Overlord of the Dark Legion is Rick Blood, Master of the Orcs in Darkness, Rick. A War of Heroes is mainly generic fantasy. They lived together peacefully for many prosperous centuries, until the day a great evil arose. So when the first game is like this, it makes Crusaders so much stranger. You go from a typical old man talking about the Magic Kingdom, to I'm desperately trying to find the outhouse at a Metallica cover band venue. That's a bold new direction, and as I'll talk about soon, they kind of pulled it off. But we're not done yet. With its mix of strategy and action and constant metal music, I don't get Blizzard clone out of this like I did with A War of Heroes. Instead, it's we believe the Wegugin will find this hardcore. Also, we're really gunning for the badass seal of approval this year. And maybe the year after. Because then they released a follow-up just called Kingdom Under Fire Heroes. Which is basically the same game, but with some new campaigns and refinements. This one's gonna come up again. On 360, they made Kingdom Under Fire Circle of Doom, which removed the RTS elements entirely to make it a hack and slash. This didn't go over well, but you could play as a crying elf girl who could kill enemies with her tears. I... I have no clue. So for Kingdom Under Fire 2, let's bring back the RTS stuff and make it an MMO. I'm gonna level with you. I have no idea what's going on in the series. So if something weird in Crusaders is explained somewhere else, I probably won't know about it. They tried to sell this as mainly standalone, and we'll see how they did. Going back to the intro, the game's premise looks pretty simple. Don't believe me? I'll show you. Check out these delts. Oh no. Oh god. This reeks of the hex. Gerald, we must go. Essa needs to be warned. Wait! Look! Make them pay with their blood. Swing away, boys! Just swipe out the enemy, you'll be golden. After the lore dump, you have two campaigns to choose between. The human soldier Gerald, who is basically Tutorial Man, and Lucy, the Dark Elf of the Dark Legion. By beating hers, you unlock a hard campaign for each faction. The hard campaigns do expect a lot more out of you compared to the base ones. It is weird that almost half the game is just preparing you for hard. It does try to ease you into the experience, but it almost goes too slowly. Gerald's missions can be so leisurely that they're basically a different game compared to Kendall's, but I'll get into that in a bit. Visually, Crusaders does some impressive things for an Xbox title. It blows my mind how many characters you can have on screen fighting at once. This was later in the console's life cycle, so they've gotten pretty good at optimizing it, but wow. It does look like the draw distance was improved for PC, but even in the immediate area, it's an intense amount of action. A lot of maps are still drowning in fog. It's not as short as something like Morrowind, but it's a less detailed world. It basically had to be to make this many characters work. Even with that, there were some times where I thought the fog added mystique to a level. A forest becomes ominous, a giant creature looks like something straight out of the mist. I still wish they bumped it up more for the PC version, but it has its moments. Bad ones too, because the terrain generally is barren, and all of the trees and rolled objects don't look nice either and will mainly get in your way. Sometimes there are more filled in areas, but the biggest battles will never be here. The more a map looks like the Gobi Desert, the better chance you have of getting a big fight. 
The units themselves are good models for an RTS game. All of the officers and named characters also get some extra detail. Ironically, it's the cutscenes where the weaknesses really show up because they put the camera right in their faces, while they're just doing their flap, breathing animation thing. They can look like nightmare people, which I don't think was the intention. Still, there is some unique art direction to be found. For once, the forces of good got most of the varied and more interesting designs. The Dark Legion mostly has similar flavors of orc. There's green, greener, undead. The Dark Elves don't have much variation either, which you know, I, I give him a pass. The true big issue is the camera. It was mainly a huge issue in Gerald's campaign, but that could be because his had the most trees in it. The angles you can have depend on where you are in the map, so even adjusting it, you can still be blocked off. Sometimes the camera wants to be in the stratosphere. Sometimes it wants to dig for worms. Usually it's fine and you don't need to adjust it too much, but it adds randomness and unpredictability in sometimes crucial moments. Sometimes you walk through the woods fine, sometimes you can't see. That said, it's really the sound that stuck out to me. With the exception of the main menu, every single song in the game is metal. I can't stress enough how constant it is. Hearing about the story, mission briefings, the missions, all metal. Sappers and catapults are to concentrate on destroying their barricades. The rear line will attack the main enemy forces and give cover to the sappers and catapults. Now I'm not a huge metalhead and I don't know how accurate I can be here. The game does have a lot of music I liked. They were not shy about the soundtrack. They go so big with it that I'm actually shocked there were no songs with lyrics in them. It wouldn't be out of place. Move! This way! There are times when it does chill out, but it's not that often. Subjectively, sure I wouldn't listen to heavy metal back to back for hours on end, but this could be someone's dream game in that regard. The issue is the rest of the sound. Archers! Ready? Draw! For the Xbox, this game has some really fucked up audio compression. Even after fiddling with audio sliders, the mixing is just terrible. But the worst part is when a fight is over. Good. We got it. Oh my god, it's fucking Lego! The cheering overlaps per troop unit, and if you lose in a fight like this... Oh my god. <laughs> if your waveform becomes a solid wall... It's time to fucking start over again. To add an extra layer of madness, it's only a sometimes deal. The actual battle soundscape is perfectly fine. There can be low quality effects that stick out as being bad, but they're not grating. Even the victory cheers will often sound normal. How it's layered is still bad, but you're not expecting an attack. So the issue is you have constant, pretty average to subpar battle sounds, combined with an occasional nuclear strike in your ears, and the whole time, metal music is playing. The music does come together with the action sometimes, and it's very cathartic. But the game is such a noise hurricane, I can only play it in bursts. Oh right, the voice acting. Look at the sun. If there truly is a god, he is on our side today. Now this will be the last briefing for today's mission, so listen well. Have you ever seen hogs do anything right the first time? Ever? Now see to it! What did you do in the war? I babysat pigs, that's what. This sucks. Gerald, I object to leaving our border post to attend mass at Youngsburg. Well, sorters, and we live to serve. At first I thought that was a glitch, but no. Insulting the- is insulting God. The Cadus would leave the- to the holy ground, and the people army- They're censoring the word Pope by just cutting the audio. The what? Them. He's a major player too, so this is bizarre. It does explain why you can't turn off the subtitles or else you'd miss part of the story. 
Characters will also say capital G God, but the captions change it to the God lowercase. It'll mess up sentence structure too, like someone had just used control F for the script. This is clearly some last minute censorship. And for everything people could get on the Catholic Church for, just mentioning the Pope, maybe a few hundred years ago in some select cities, but not in 2004. South Korea did and still does have a significant Christian population there, so I thought maybe they were pushing the boundary of some kind of local law, but no. From what I've found, at the last second the developers were terrified that including the Pope would offend Westerners. You can't exactly remove him from the story at this point when he's so integral, so they clipped all audio mentioning him and in subtitles he's just the patriarch. Boy, if only they knew where things would be so soon. Anyway, the PC release also included the option for the original Korean voice acting, which seems way better technically and delivery-wise. For this we have been bled white. Soldiers, behold, the holy ground. Still, I don't want to be getting into the story just yet. Despite all of its many, many faults, the gameplay is worth talking about. By using your right stick, you control the direction and the range your troops move in. By holding a shoulder button, you can expand the minimap and move your forces that way. You can move all your forces at once, or cycle through them for individual orders. There is a learning curve to this, and it does explain the slowness of Gerald's campaign. Despite first impressions, there is a shocking amount of depth. For one, with the triggers, you can change the formations of most units. Putting your soldiers in wider formations allows them to move and turn faster. A tight-knit formation can make a unit sneakier and harder to see. If they have shields, they're better at covering each other from arrows. Each has benefits and drawbacks, and you can be adjusting these almost as much as you're moving your army. However, not every unit uses these formations. In the case of archers, the triggers control how wide or narrow their shots go. If your enemy's position isn't clear, or you're fighting from extreme range, you need to make guesses on how you should be shooting. Or, you can send a smaller force or a deployable scout ahead to act as a spotter. Then you can get the exact bombardment width you need. Also take into account the position of your ranged units, where they are relative to the enemy, is the sun in their eyes, is anything in their way? There is a lot of good tactical gameplay to be had, and not all units can be set to attack and forget. With cavalry you don't want to move them onto the enemy, but instead move through them. They'll barrel through weaker troops and can take out a formation without taking a scratch. You could micro them around for max effectiveness, or set some waypoints in a busy area and hope for the best. Though again, you've got to be thinking carefully. Are there anti-cavalry units in the area? Where a good charge can delete a unit, a bad charge into them can have your own wiped out. So if you're quick and clever enough, you can bait fast movers into spears that they can't turn away from easily. Or in the case of the Dark Legion, the anti-horse throwing axes. Not everything will add up sometimes, it, it's fine. Must have an orc for a tailor. Again, these are just some maneuvering examples. In battle, you have a resource called SP, which might be special points, I don't think they say. But you earn it through general combat and victories, and gain more by pulling off tactical maneuvers. You can then spend these Sun Tzu points on unit abilities. Human archers can use fire arrows to burn down forests and enemy positions. Contrast with dark elf archers who can make magic arrows for extra damage. Or summon a magic fancy tree of healing, because of course they do that. There are sappers who can place Burmese tiger pits, landmines, and other toys from the Viet Cong fun box to bait enemies into. Though they can also go on anti-trap duty themselves. And sometimes units are led by officers who know magic, so sometimes you send out a blizzard or plunge your enemy into darkness. So while all of this is happening, how does the action hack and slash kick assing fit into it? It's a tricky situation. It's deceptive because at first it seems undercooked and just kind of bad, when instead it's well thought out but it doesn't show in the first stages of the game. When a unit led by your hero engages the enemy, the game shifts over into action mode. Both squads engage on their own and you can personally run around slapping people. Each campaign only has one controllable hero. Gerald is your basic sword fight man. I can't say anything bad because I make guys just like him in most RPGs. He hits with a big sword, blocks with a big sword, and hates the orcs. Oh, all this fried hog. All we need now is some scrambled eggs. Lucretia of the Dark Legion is all about speed and anime bullshit. She can't block, but she can dodge. She likes bullying her ex-boyfriend. That's my Lucy. Don't call me Lucy, you gigolo! Kendall is a slower powerhouse warrior. He carries a mason halberd and is a loyal servant of the Pope. When he wins fights, he's already looking for the next heretic to smash. Rainier is the Dark Lord of Hexter. He has an evil sword and loves running around in a loincloth and World of Warcraft pauldrons. He parries by using the Force and is rumored to be Rick Blood. Of course he's Rick Blood. I am Rick Blood. The characters have different fighting styles, but calling what they have move sets would be generous. You have your light and strong attacks, and maybe two or three unique combos per character. They also have a special execution move that does more damage, but costs SP. If the hero's unit has officers in it, they can also spend SP to use the unique officer assist attack. These can be helpful, but they're things you've usually picked out far before the battle started. You never have something like a duel with another unique character. 
you can try to find the enemy unit's officer and kill them. If you pull it off, morale shatters and the squad disintegrates. Certain characters are much better at this. Lucy takes a while, Baywatch Sauron can one-shot them. Usually though, half the challenge is finding the leaders since they don't always stand out. They can often look identical to regular soldiers, and you can only pick one out when you whack one and a health bar pops up. Summed up, there's not a lot of depth to the action mode, which reasonably you might have been expecting more out of, because the Dynasty Warriors in the room is very focused on pulling off combos and special moves, and first looking at Crusaders, you might expect it to be a Dynasty Warriors clone. The combat here is simpler, but it's because the developers didn't want you stuck too far into it. You still have your troops to cycle back to. Instead of staying completely in the fight, you send out a cavalry charge, or move your archers behind the enemy. Both tactics and pure Ungabunga hits reward you with SP, which you can use on either. So you could pull off a flank with archers, but then go right back into action mode to pull off an assist move. Crusaders really is about strategy more than anything, and this is reflected by the other side of the game, which is battle preparation. As you win missions, you're awarded with golden experience. Again, this is tied to your SP levels, so the bigger your brain, the more you gain. Your squads all have a level, but it's determined by the leading officer, so experience is spent on them, but really it goes through the whole unit. Which at first seems odd, but there is a good reason for this. As long as the unit has the required skills, it can convert into another one freely. An officer could lead spearmen in one mission, and then use mortars in the next. Your leaders will be specialized for only a few types, but you do have some flexibility. Due to action mode, your campaign hero is always stuck with a melee unit, but for their underlings, you can adjust all kinds of things around. You could focus on a troop type or unlock a magic specialization. It's also here you learn that troops are resistant and weak to different damage types. Armored knights get owned by lightning, orcs have an innate weakness to ice, and the undead hate learning about Jesus, which in this setting might be orc Jesus. I may have missed that part. When you're done with experience, you can use the gold to hire more officers and get more options. How many troops you can deploy is limited, so it's not always ideal. Instead, you're usually buying new equipment, which can have all kinds of bonus effects. These are also level restricted, so there is a balancing act between your skills and your money. Playing your cards right, you can get some absurd min-maxing. Like, what if my hero's unit was virtually immune to melee damage, and was constantly self-healing? If you spend a lot of time in action mode, you could give your hero something like an elemental weapon. There's a lot to play around with, and to add an extra layer of greatness to the system, the units do physically change based on the upgrades. At first glance, it's easy to see Crusaders as a dumb metal mosh pit, but there's so much behind it. You'll never be controlling a huge amount of units, and some, like flyers, are controlled to the D-pad like an ability. This causes some drawbacks later on. The hard campaigns give you a ton of freedom, but what's actually viable is much more limited. Your enemies are far more reactive, and now they cast spells like Merlin has learned he has only a week to live. Later missions become pure endurance. Where healing magic can be incredibly helpful before, you need it now. If you became reliant on abilities instead of movement and formations, that'll really hurt you in these sections. It expects more clever maneuvering from you here than ever before, which is cool and I like that, but it becomes clear a lot of fun options you had before will melt away as the stakes raise. Things can start feeling even more repetitive than they were before. If you like the proper massive battles, there's gonna be a lot of them. So that brings me to the story. The overall points are very simple, but there are finer details I'm not even going to bother to bring up. There's a lot of political details that mainly rely on you knowing about the first game, and other points aren't addressed in this game, but instead in Heroes, which is both a prequel and happening at the same time. So the story isn't all here to begin with. Dark Elves are ruled by vampires, but there are High Elves who want to rebel, but they use the terms interchangeably. So Haranadin finally falls under this High Elf's feet. Is this not the first time you're leading an army this large, my Dark Elf? And look, I don't give a shit. In the campaign map, you can get some story, manage your army, and poke at some lore tidbits. A lot of information can come from eavesdropping at pubs. Gerald's campaign might have the least information here because the pub is full of people complaining about the elves, or as they call them, the Darks. Boss! Darks are coming! From the southwest! Those Darks planned this all along. Look what those Darks did to our people. You go to bars where generic rock plays and overhear people loudly complaining about Darks. This isn't my first rodeo with this. So, unfortunate translation aside, that's probably the most interesting thing in Gerald's campaign. He is the most Xbox game protagonist who wants to wipe out the enemy and get revenge. In retrospect, it's neat, but it's a horribly generic first impression for the campaigns. Lucy's campaign is more entertaining, but also for a dumb reason. Instead of their dialogue being, we must wipe out the enemy and defeat the evil, they argue constantly. They try to bring up the elf political situation, but it's basically a joke. It's like the cast of the Jersey Shore is trying to do a table reading of the Council of Rivendell, but there was a party the night before where everyone cheated on everyone so they keep breaking character to yell at each other. They go to meet the Dark Lord of the Orcs, and this is their first reaction. Rainier has arrived. Wow. Finally in the flesh! Oh my god, he's ripped! Huh? It does devolve back into dry politics, but good god, it's something. 
Kendall is also wipe out the enemy man, but he is uncovering something. His campaign takes a dramatic turn, and I would say the exact same thing about Rick Blood's campaign. Both are fighting for control of the Ancient Heart, but something doesn't seem right. Also, the orcs in his pub really just want to farm. Sometimes they want to use the enemy as fertilizer, but they really love farming. And not all of them want to eat man flesh. These are weird orcs. Anyway, if you don't want spoilers, go to here. Okay, so remember the village burning in the beginning? That was a false flag attack by other humans. Again, the details are in the next game. The Pope received a vision from God to destroy the Ancient Heart, but so did someone else, a man named Walter. Walter was going to make a secret alliance with Dark Elves who didn't like being ruled by vampires to help him find the Heart. As you'd expect, this kind of team-up would be very frowned upon, so they had to do it in secret. A nearby villager saw the meeting and ran home. To keep the secret, Walter and his troops would have to slaughter them all. This is the first mission of Walter's campaign in Heroes, and it's pretty brutal. As the war kicks off, Walter does manage to get the heart, but the Pope, for some reason, says that Walter has stolen it. So the Pope uses Kendall to try and hunt him down and retrieve it. Kendall does catch up with Walter, but Walter claims the Pope wants to keep the heart for himself. Why would the Pope not want to break what God told him to? In Rick Blood's campaign, it's revealed that the heart has direct control over him. Whoever has it can directly puppet him, so he's trying to find it for himself to stop this. He breaks away from his own homeland and fights everybody on the way to the heart. He's desperate to control his own destiny. In Gerald's campaign, he's just the big evil bad guy. And in a terrible slow motion cutscene, Rick rolls one of his friends directly into oblivion. But he doesn't slaughter everyone else. Then, despite the efforts of everyone, Walter manages to fulfill God's plan and break the heart, giving a pre-rendered cutscene for the first time in the game. Which god did this vision come from? It turns out Breaking the Heart starts what looks like the advent. It's kind of amazing. Nothing to this point indicated the game would go to this kind of scale. Anyhow, that's when the Demon Swarm begins. The next missions get different. Your enemy is now an apocalyptic swarm of demons. The world is now threatened by a cosmic horror. The demons will consume all of life and usher in the Age of Darkness. Without the heart, Baywatch Sauron will slowly become mortal and one day die. He's just as horrified as everyone else. What have the humans done? This is... Encoplosa. No! Rick Blood initiates peace talks with everyone and unites the world against the threat. He explains that there's a god of light and darkness, but only one can be awake at a time. Whenever the heart deteriorates from the ravages of time, one god awakens and the other goes to sleep. It's actually supposed to be the Age of Darkness, but someone had destroyed the last heart early. So Encablosa, the god of darkness, has successfully tricked his time back. Rick Blood becomes the hero in uniting the world and says things that I would never imagine from this character design. I want to return the world to the Age of Light. It's far from the first game to pull out the third faction who's a threat to everyone, but it does it in such an interesting and unexpected way. Generic Xbox man and his heroism are just a pawn for greater schemes. Religion itself is mostly wrong and there are just Lovecraftian elder gods. The immortal Dark Lord figure knows all of this and has been working with it in mind. This story has some fascinating elements, but a lot of execution up until now has been terrible. Heard you might get promoted soon. Way to go, Lucy. No thanks to you, dumbass. While this only happens at the tail end of the hard campaigns, they both have the most torturous final mission possible. It's the same for each, too. Pierce the surface of Encoblosa with a flying unit, then conduct a ritual to get inside of it. The camera has generally been better in the hard campaigns, but now, this is all trees. Swarms of demons packed inside a giant forest during a snowstorm. And the map is laid out like a canyon that you need to snake through. 
If you pull it off, the mission then begins a second part, which is killing the avatar of the Dark God from inside of him. I've gotta say, when I started the game, I did not see things going this way. But Halloween is right around the corner. The K Berserk mission sucks in a lot of ways. It doesn't feel like an ultimate test of your tactics or anything you learned. Inside the Eclipse is slightly better, but it's a slog of a battle up until then. It is fun blowing up demons with artillery, but they managed to make that get old. I should never be tired of shelling demons. When you win, you do get to see it die and explode, which is satisfying, but the epilogues after that are weak. There are a lot of tidbits here, but out of everything, I mainly recall how many ex-girlfriends got credits. Imagine if every game did that. Crusaders is incredibly ambitious, and especially for an Xbox game. There's a lot of strategic depth to it and many ways to play out missions. It's a full-length game just running through all of them once. It is held back by the camera, general clunkiness, and some atrocious sound at points, but a lot of it might already be addressed in a way. There are seven campaigns and I'm not far in, but what I've played of here has fixed a lot of it. The camera behaves way better with obstacles. The fighting flows a little smoother and there's no nuclear cheering. Good work. It also has custom battles in it, so there's a lot to dig into. Both the PC versions came out for $20, which is far too expensive for this kind of port. I did ask if they could put it on sale for the video, but I haven't heard back yet, so we'll see. I could recommend Crusaders in the same way you recommend, like, a really violent B-movie. It's violent and silly, and you can't believe some parts they think you'll take seriously. But you can see that this is a cool idea, and you wish they had more time and budget. But maybe that couldn't help as much as you think because this is so different. Even that comparison doesn't feel fair because this is a genuinely tactical game. It's something unique. I'm sure there's a lot of people who picked this up for the first time as a kid or a teenager on Xbox, and for them it was an awesome game. In a lot of ways they were right because the core gameplay holds up. It's just those details that a lot of people take for granted that do hold it back. You know, the idea game won't try to blow up your ears sometimes. That's it for now, but October is coming. I might have time to talk about a smaller horror game or two because unfortunately for us all, another adventure game video is in the works. One far darker than the Druids. I'll see you then. Maybe. Oh god. Ah. Do I like Baldur's Gate? Yeah, but that video is a long ways out. I'm still irritated by what Beamdog did with one. Thoughts on the buggy launch of the new Pathfinder game? I already assume new games will be all kinds of messed up, and CRPGs is like 10 times that. After Pillars of Eternity 1, I don't play games like that until they've been out at least a few months. Do you remember the first video game that you played? I actually do. It's probably cliche, but it was the original Mario Brothers, and I was playing it with my dad. He was visiting Japanese friends in their country, and he saw their system there, and he learned about games that way. Which is funny, because they had been all over America at this point, and I don't know how he missed it. But I guess I've always been many years behind with games since birth, really. How long do I play a game to see if it's worth the effort? If you mean on my own, unless I've been told something, usually between two to three hours. If it's for a video, I think I've played to the end every single time. Usually multiple times. Is there an era of games my brain is hardwired to like? Well, I don't know about hardwired, but late 90s and early 2000s ones are generally more interesting. The high-budget games were generally chasing unique ideas over trends. There's still cool AAA stuff now, but a lot of it does blur together. If you're not chasing the biggest budget title, I can't think of a better time to like games. Okay, until next time. Minigame? What? What minigame?